And welcome back to another video here on Joe Chem. Okay, gang, I want to touch on basically one thing in this video. It's going to be a shorter video, which we always like. I want to talk about hard and soft nucleophiles, the differences between them, what are they in the first place, uh, and what you should look for if you are given a nucleophile and you're unsure whether it is a hard or soft nucleophile. And then at the end, I'm going to give you kind of the list of these are the typical hard nucleophiles you will interact with. Here are the soft ones you'll interact with because the list is very predictable. In the in my experiences with helping students, you know, this the you know the characters that are the hard nucleophiles are common, you know, between the you know different schools and colleges of people that I personally interacted with. Okay, so hard and soft nucleophiles, what are they? Well, it's terminology to describe how reactive a nucleophile is. So for example, a hard nucleophile is more reactive, more unstable, if you will, is better at, you know, you know, being negative and attacking things as opposed to a soft nucleophile. So looking at the hard nucleophile, what is typical of one? Well, they're smaller in size and they are very, very, very negative. Now think about that, especially in the context of way back when we talked about acid base chemistry. If something's going to harbor a negative charge, an atom per se, and just one atom, let's just say the charge is just on a singular atom. The bigger the atom is, the more area for that charge, you know, the more area that charge has to spread out, be more stable, get away from other electrons and negative charges, you know, on that atom. Well, with hard nucleophiles, we're looking for smaller atoms and that small atom will have the negative charge on itself completely. And what that adds up to is a negative charge that is densely located, which means it's very reactive. It's going to be looking to interact with something else and share that negative charge. And what is characteristic of a hard nucleophile is that it performs one, two additions. Now, if you've already looked at the Michael addition and what a one, four addition is, right? So typically in the context of just a regular carbonyl, just this ketone that I've drawn, this three carbon, ketone, a one, two addition is if a nucleophile were just to add right to the carbonyl carbon. So what have we done that with? Well, you've definitely done that with Grignard reagents like this, uh, organo lithiums and such. And again, I'm getting into more of what the examples of what hard nucleophiles and soft nucleophiles are, but that's what I mean by one, two addition. You start numbering at the carbonyl oxygen and then uh, the, the carbonyl carbon is number two. And in the context of alpha, beta, unsaturated carbonyls, or enones, if you want to call them that, uh, even if there's a 1,4 addition present right here, and we know there's a resonance structure that looks like this, hard nucleophiles, they look still to the carbonyl carbon, given as, you know, given how reactive they are, they hone in on that partially positive carbonyl carbon. Now, soft nucleophiles, what's the difference? So they are actually going to be neutral or they can still have a negative charge. They can have both, but it's very common that the negative charge is delocalized. It's not just on a single atom. It can maybe move and, you know, is shared amongst the network of atoms via resonance. A good example of that is acetate. So if we look at acetate right here, it's just acetic acid without its proton. Yes, we can see a negative charge on this oxygen, but it's not just on that oxygen. We know we can draw resonance like this and this. So really that negative charge is shared between two different atoms. It's not just on one atom like it would be in methyl Grignard, for example, which we know really looks like this. So just to highlight the difference, right? This carbon is completely bearing the burden of that negative charge. But over here, that burden is split between two different atoms. Uh, and, you know, like I said, you can have neutral nucleophiles as well. So it doesn't even just have to be acetic acid. You could have a nucleophile be acetic acid, right? And that's just one example. One thing that is characteristic of soft nucleophiles is that they perform one for addition. So again, if you had this enone, you know, slash alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl situation, if, and if you had a soft nucleophile, it looks to attack at the fourth position versus the second. And if that's something that you're unfamiliar with, I highly recommend to check out the Michael edition uh, slash one for, you know, so addition with soft nucleophiles video here on Joe Chem. I'll link it in the description below. Uh, and 
as opposed to being smaller in size, soft nucleophiles, they're larger and what you can call more polarizable. Now, what that means is if we had something like bromide, for example, and you can look at any of the halogens like bromide, chloride, iodide, not fluoride. Fluoride actually fits over here because of how small it is. But bromine is pretty large. It's very far down in terms of rows on the periodic table. It has a lot of energy layer. So it's a big atom. It's very large in size. As a result, it has a big electron cloud. So even though it has a minus one charge, that minus one charge has a ginormous area to spread itself out around. It's not like it's densely located in one position, right? As opposed to what is characteristic of hard nucleophiles. So since it's very large, it's not like there's a single location that is just packed full of negative charge. That kind of decreases the reactivity of the nucleophile. Now, don't get me wrong. Bromide, it's an excellent nucleophile. It's super good. It's just not going to be considered a hard nucleophile. Okay, gang, let me clean this up. And then I just want to kind of give you, here are the hard nucleophiles you should kind of be on the lookout for and will commonly encounter. And then I'll just kind of give you um, some soft nucleophiles that, you know, what I do want to say is that this is not a like one size fits all, um, you know, split down the middle type definition for hard and soft. There may be exceptions. In my experience, you don't encounter them in typical organic chemistry one and two classes. And what I'm about to show you is what you will typically run into. So let me erase this. We'll take a look and close out this video. Okay, gang, to finish out this video, I just want to look at, you know, the common hard nucleophile and soft nucle bleh, nucleophile characters you'll typically run into in your organic career. So this list, the hard nucleophile list, is a lot, in my opinion, shorter than the list of soft nucle nucleophiles you can run into. Just because these can be neutral, they can have a negative charge, you know, there's just so many more possibilities than, the, than you know, the, what I'll call the real reactive nucleophiles. So the hard nucleophiles that you will commonly run into, your organolithium. So anything with, you know, a carbon that has a negative charge attached to lithium. So for example, like butyl lithium, very, 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 very common reagent, you know, seen in the classroom and used in real life. Uh, Grignard reagents, again, not a super big surprise here. That was something you encountered, I'm assuming in OCHEM 1, you know, very reactive. You've used them a ton. Lithium aluminum hydride or LAH, right? This is your most reactive source of hydride, hydrogen with a negative charge. And think about that. That makes sense that it's a hard nucleophile. It's the smallest atom on the periodic table. And when it has a negative charge, it's super, you know, a super dense negative charge. It has nowhere to go, really spread itself out. And fluoride, right? Again, super small atom, very electronegative. We know fluorine, very reactive. Now on the soft nucleophile side, I just threw up a couple that are very common that you probably uh, have used or have run into already. So alcohols, right? Just anything attached to OH, it's neutral, which is why it's not nearly as reactive as the hard nucleophile counterparts. Uh, cyanide, it's an excellent nucleophile, but I think as you can see there, you know, maybe the resonance structures aren't amazing, but you can certainly draw some resonance. So there are resonance structures that exist where the negative charge isn't just on the carbon as a result, right? The charge isn't just focused and localized on that carbon. It can be delocalized. It can be given to the nitrogen, for example. And, you know, and excluding fluoride, right? Chloride, bromide, iodide. Those are your halides, right? Your halogens with a negative charge, those halogen anions that are really excellent nucleophiles, but they're just not crazy reactive and that deals with their growing size and the polarizability uh, of the negative charge being able to kind of spread itself out around the big uh, size of the atom. Enolates, right? We've talked about, you know, how the, the charge, you know, can be delocalized, making the nucleophile not hard, but soft. And we know that's because that's not the only format that enolates exist in. We know there's resonance such that enolates exist like this as well. So the negative charge is kind of, you know, split between the oxygen and the carbon, even though we know the carbon is the nucleophilic atom in an enolate. And last but not least, something we, you know, I threw in, and maybe you cover this in your class, maybe you don't, right? But cuprates, or they, you know, they're also referred to as Gilman 
the, the, the Gilman reagent. They're just a less nucleophilic version of Grignard reagents. Okay, so gang, if you had any confusion about hard versus soft nucleophiles, I hope maybe this cleared it up a little bit. I'm going to have this video appear in multiple series, definitely in the ketone and aldehyde carbonyl series, as well as the carboxylic acid derivative series, because that kind of plays into, you know, with more reactive carboxylic acid derivatives, how many times, you know, nucleophiles will attack. Will it be one time? Will it be two times? So I think this is a, a good video to uh, pop up and appear multiple times. And that's pretty much it, gang. Thank you again for watching, whether you're watching from YouTube, whether you're on jokehem.io, my website, you're the best. I love you. And if you're watching from YouTube, make sure to pop over to jokehem.io because it's the same videos, you know, chunked up into categories, you know, sections, playlists, if you will. Uh, and it's the same videos, but there's also free worksheets and solutions. So go check them out. Try the practice. There's, you know, practice where you make sure you get your footing and then there's harder practice to really put your abilities to the test. And no matter what, I hope to see you all in the next video.